Okay, uh, so basically what uh, connection resiliency is, it kind of comes into play once you take your application and you put it on a network server. Uh, so whether it's Azure or you know, a different service, when the network gets busy, there are times when the server won't be able to execute commands. And right now, what would happen is there would be an error. And if you implement connection resiliency for a certain number of times, the, your app will send the command over and over again uh, until the server can handle it. And the default number of times that it'll send a command is four. And it waits about 20 seconds. Uh, and typically, if a, if a network is busy, um, within that, those four times, uh, it'll be able to process the command. Uh, so that's basically what connection resiliency is. And once you implement that, in order to test it, uh, you do something what's called command interception. So command interception basically deals with uh, intercepting a SQL command that's going to be sent to the server, and then um, you replace it with basically a little error. And then it'll kind of re-execute the command the four times, and in your code, then after the fourth time, you'll tweak it so that it can go through. And I'll show you how, what that looks like. And you can actually see your app sending the command four times in our output window. So we'll be taking a look at all of that. Um, and then the last thing that we're gonna do is enable code first migrations. And we do that uh, basically when we're done testing the app and we're getting ready to deploy it. And so what we're going to do today is do the code first migrations in Contasso, which is basically the easiest kind of app to do it in because we only have one context file. Uh, and what I'm going to show you guys next week is how to do code first migrations in applications have, that have more than one context file. Okay, so we're going to start kind of with the simple and then we'll move to the more complicated. So connection resiliency. Uh, so this is a feature in Entity Framework. And as I mentioned, it retries failed SQL queries. And the default in MVC, uh, it does assume that you're deploying to Azure. Uh, so a lot of the code and things that are built in are for Azure, but you could tweak it basically to work with anything else. Uh, in order to get connection resiliency to work, uh, you basically have to know uh, what exceptions are caused by network connectivity. Uh, and the exception number that we're gonna use is 20, but there are some others that also indicate that the network is busy. Um, you have to know how long you're going to wait between tries, and so for us, it's going to be about 20 seconds, and how many tries it should do before giving up, and we're going to be using four uh, because that is the default, but I'll show you where the four is coded because you could actually change that number. Uh, and as I mentioned, uh, the settings for Azure are kind of pre-configured, so that is what we are going to be using. And in order to set this up, we are going to have to create a new class. And uh, it's going to look very similar to this example, pretty much identical. <laughs> and uh, you'll see that we are deriving our new class from DB configuration. And basically, we're setting an execution strategy. And this is assuming that we're using Azure. But if you wanted to use something else, it's just a matter of looking up what command you have to put in there. So when you guys go through hands-on one, which we're going to do during lab, 
uh, you'll notice uh, the directions are pretty specific. So you're gonna create a school configuration file, add it to the data access layer folder. Okay, and then you have to modify the student controller, add a new using statement, and then uh, that is the only controller that we actually added uh, try and catch to. And for all of the catch statements, you are going to replace catch with catch retry limit exceeded exception. Okay, some of the catch statements don't have anything in parentheses. I think one has data exception in parentheses and you're just going to replace all of them with this. Okay, that's the only thing you're gonna replace. You're not gonna replace anything else that's in the block. Okay, so that's gonna be your hands-on one. So at that point, you're gonna have a retry policy, but you have no way to test the retry policy. And that is where command interception comes into play. So as I mentioned, uh, this involves intercepting the SQL command and basically replacing it with kind of a temporary error. Uh, and so the best practice for doing this is to use uh, an interface uh, instead of hard coding commands to system diagnostics. Okay. Um, you'll see that we do use the trace uh, method, uh, which is part of systems diagnostics, but that is in the implementation of our template. So hands-on two involves creating the template and implementing the template. So for this, we are going to create a new folder called logging. And in that folder, we're actually gonna have two classes. We're gonna have I logger. So that's an I and not an L, uppercase I. <laughs> um, and that stands for interception logger, okay? And then we're going to be using this code, okay? So this is basically gonna be like our template. And you can see that we have like the little function header uh, and it's overloaded or method header and it's overloaded. Uh, and there's one for like informational errors, one for warnings, one for regular errors. And then we have something called trace API. Uh, trace API is used when you're accessing an external database. So it's not part of your app. So it's basically somebody else's database. Okay, the other three would be errors generated in your own database app. Okay, so these are the different levels of tracing that we're gonna implement. And again, this is our template. So that's the first class you're gonna create. The second class that you're gonna put in the logging folder, this one is called logger, and this implements the template. So you can see, we have logger implementing iLogger. And then you can see that we have kind of fleshed out all of these methods. So we've got information, the three different overloaded information methods. Then we've got warning, we've got error, and at the bottom we have trace API. Uh, you'll also notice that for a lot of them, we are calling format exception message. And that happens to be a little function that is located down here. Okay, so uh, basically all of these are calling trace, uh, trace error, which is part of the systems diagnostic. Okay, and this is all used to generate and record errors. Uh, and, you know, in the real world, you are going to occasionally have errors. So having all of this in place is a good thing because it helps you problem solve. 
Now, if you are interested in this system diagnostic area and you want to learn more about it, okay, I do have a link uh, to a document that you can read. It's not really required, okay, but in case you want to know more about it, it is there for you guys to look at. So do you have any questions so far? Okay, no questions? Okay, <laughs> moving forward. Um, so at this point, uh, we would be ready, um, let's see. Okay, so we would be doing our interceptor classes. And we're gonna be getting into that in hands-on three. Uh, so you'll see what those look like down there. The only other thing that we would need to implement this is we gotta make a little change to global.asax. Uh, and so if we go into global.asax, uh, there's a couple different commands we have to add, uh, dbinterception.add. And then one is for the errors and one is for the logging. Okay, and these two lines of code can be put into global ASAX. They could also be put into DB configuration, but you do not want to put them in both places because then they'll execute twice and that's, you don't want that. What we're going to do is put ours in global ASAX, okay? Um, we're not going to put it in the other one. So the interceptor classes. Uh, we're going to create two classes. Uh, the first one is called School Interceptor Logging. That goes in the DAL folder. Uh, and this is the code that you are going to be using. So this is kind of uh, canned code. Uh, it's standardized and it is for errors or handling errors. Uh, you'll notice that there is a watch uh, object in here uh, and that is keeping track of time. And then if there's an error, it basically throws the error and restarts the stopwatch. Okay, so you can kind of go through here and see the different types of errors, non-query executing, read executing, and then the first one was scalar executing. So different types of errors that can be thrown. Okay, and again, this was canned code. So this is not special code for Contasso. It's pretty, it's applicable, applicable to any project that you would be working on. Uh, then uh, the next one is called School Interceptor Transient Errors. And this one has been customized for our particular application uh, because the way that we are going to simulate an error is in our student index. In the search box, we're gonna key in the word throw and then we are going to hit search. And it's going to simulate an error. It's going to generate an error code of 20 it's gonna generate an error message. And we have this all set up so that it's going to re-execute that command four times. After the fourth time, what it's gonna do then is if you remember the search box, we can do searches on first name and last name. So it's going to fill in AN for the first name, AN for the last name, and go ahead and execute the command. This code is where all of that is located. So you can see that we create a new logger object. Uh, we are overriding reader executing. And you can see throw transient error is false. And then it checks the count. If the count is greater than zero, and the first 
parameter, so that would be, I believe, last name, uh, is equal to throw. Then it comes through here and it changes throw transient error to true, and you can see that it's filling in first name and last name with AN. Then it checks to see if throw transient errors is true. Well, when we do throw and we hit search and it comes through there, it is going to be true, okay? But the counter is uh, actually still going to be less than four, okay? So this is true, this is less than four, so it adds one to the counter and it creates a dummy SQL exception. So we come down here where we have create dummy SQL exception and this is where it's getting that error number of 20. And the rest of the code in here is to simulate an error message. And you will see that error message when we actually run the application and put throw in there. We're gonna open up the output and we're gonna take a look and you will see that, okay? So it's going to do that four times. When the counter reaches four, so that would be our fifth time through, uh, then this is going to test false and it's going to go ahead and execute with the AN in first name and last name. Uh, the next thing you guys are going to change is that global ASAX file. You're going to add the DB interception code to that file. Okay, and then you're going to go ahead and run a build. And at this point, you're going to be able to run it. And when you open up the output, it's going to look something like this. You can actually see the SQL commands that it's going to execute. Uh, you can hit enter throw in here. Okay, and here is the SQL commands. You can see the error number. And you can actually go through the log and count four. And then you're not going to see it anymore. And you'll notice that it has retrieved the uh, first name or last name of AN. So um, that's basically how we're going to be testing this. And if you want to see what the difference is between having an execution strategy and not having one, okay? Once you've run it and you see how it works, if you go back into school configuration and you comment out set execution strategy, and then you run the page again, and you enter throw in the search, and you hit the search button, you are going to get an exception error. And that did not happen when we had the execution strategy. So that's one reason for putting those in. Okay, after you test that, then you're gonna go remove the comment and compile again. Okay, and then you'll be done with that phase. Do you guys have any questions about that? Nope. Okay, because I'm pretty sure I have that. I can actually run it for you just so you can see what it looks like. I just have to find the one that I modified the other day. In my mess of a hard drive here. Pretty sure it was this one. As usual, it opened in the wrong window here. <laughs> We're pulling it over. Okay, let me.
We're going to want to see the output window while this runs. Where is it? There it is. All right, so if I go into students, Hopefully it'll hurry. And then I key in throw. Okay, so you can see right now, there's the 20. And there's the 20 up here. It actually does this relatively quickly. Okay, and so I saw two of them and it's already done. So, so it's done all four of them. So there must be a couple of them up here. Here's another one. Uh, it's done all four of them and then it went forward and executed. Okay, and it still works for everything else. But what I like about this, having this uh, go into the output window, you can actually kind of watch those SQL commands as they're accessing the database, which I think is kind of cool. So you can select different things and actually see those commands in here. Okay, so that was all connection resiliency and command interception. So now we are going to talk about migrations. So the, what we're going to do in Contasso is the simplest kind of migration uh, because we only have one context file. Uh, so to do the migrations, we're going to use the package manager console. And at the package manager prompt, if you only have one context file, then all you have to do is say enable migrations. Okay, and then you have to add a migration and you have to give a name for that initial creation file. Okay, and then after that, you give a command to update the database. So it's basically three commands. You enable the migration, you add the migration, you get the first one, and then from then on, anything that you do you just have to update database. So one context file is the absolute easiest way to do migrations. Unfortunately, in your final projects, you're going to have two context files. <laughs> you're going to have one for authentication, and you're also going to have one for all of your other models. That's a little bit more difficult. So um, I'm going to, I'm actually working on getting all of that to work uh, and I will be showing you that next week uh, because it's a little bit more complicated. You end up having to do migrations twice and you have to be very specific about the locations for those files and you also have to be more specific about the location for the output files. Okay, so um, we'll be covering those next week. For Contasso, uh, what we're going to do is in our web config file, we are commenting out. You can either comment out or remove the context that has the uh, location of your context file and the location of your initializer. And you can see I commented it out because that is an HTML comment. Okay. And if you want to completely delete it, that's fine. Or you can comment it out. The second thing that you're going to change in the web config file is the name 
of the database because you want to start with like a brand new clean one. Okay, so just changing the name to Contasa University 2 is going to give you that clean start for your database. Uh, then you're going to open up the Package Manager Console. Now, a really weird thing happened to me. Um, my Package Manager Console would not open. Uh, if when I went to Tools and when I went to the NuGet and I, and I tried to open it, it just wouldn't open. I couldn't open it through the keyboard commands. I couldn't open it through the menu. Uh, I searched around online trying to find some kind of resolution, found nothing. So what I did was I uninstalled Visual Studio and then I reinstalled Visual Studio. And you know how long that takes. It took like two hours to uninstall and <laughs> at least two hours to reinstall, but now it works fine. So that did resolve the problem. So if, uh, if you, any of you uh, don't have the package manager console, if the window does not pop up, you're probably gonna have to do the same thing. Once you get into the console, then uh, the command that you need to enter first is just enable migrations, just like that. Okay. And what that does is it creates a folder called migrations. And you're gonna see a configuration CS file in there. And if we take a look, let me make this much smaller. Okay, so this is the configuration file. And you can see I've got some seed data in there. And that is because uh, it's actually going to seed our database for us. And then you are going to do an add migration initial create. So add migration initial create. Let me pull this back over. Hopefully I can, it's not coming. Uh, but in the migration folder, there was an add uh, or initial create with a date in front of it. So let me try to get this back over here so you can see that. For some reason, it wants the output over there. There. All right. So here's the initial create with the date. Okay, so if you take a look at that, uh, this has got, and it pretty much does this for basically anything where you have add migration, uh, it has an up and a down method. So the up method, if you look, this is where the tables are created. And the down method removes them. So basically, if there's a problem and it needs to roll back, it goes through the down method. Okay? Otherwise, it goes through the up method and it creates everything. So this should look super familiar to you guys because uh, these are all create table commands. They're specifying primary keys. Down here is code for foreign keys and indexing. And then when we look at the drop or the, the down, it's removing the keys and the index before it removes the tables. That all makes perfect sense. Okay, so that is what is in initial create. Now for the configuration, you guys are going to end up adding that C data in there. So I've got a file for you. And this has all of the seed data. So this would be production seed data. Okay, so this is different than your test. And the only code in here that's probably gonna look unfamiliar 
is add or update because in our test environment, when we had the C data, we added it. Uh, and now it's got add or update. So uh, basically, if there is nothing there, it's going to add. If there is an existing row there uh, that's got the same key, it's going to update it. Okay, and it's that's just because there could be some leftover test data in your database. So uh, add or update is also called an upsert. <laughs> so it's like an update insert, okay, upsert. Okay, so uh, you are gonna be modifying that file. And let's see. I think we've pretty much covered everything. Uh, your initial create file. This is the code that you're going to want to use. I showed you that a minute ago. Um, so you'll replace what's in initial create with this. And once you do all of that, uh, you are going to run a build and then you can do your update. Now, if there is a problem, and if there's going to be a problem in migrations, it's always in update database. You're not going to have a problem in enable. You're not going to have a problem with add migration. It almost always comes with update database. <laughs> so, um, one thing that you can modify that may fix the problem is if you go into the configuration file and where it says automatic migrations enabled, change it to true. Sometimes that will resolve the problem. So then, you know, you'd save it, you'd run a build and do update database again. So to recap all of this, you are going to comment out the context in web config you are going to change the name of the database in web config then you'll save run a build and open up the package manager console you're going to enable migrations and then you're going to add the migration initial create both of these should work you should not have problems with either one of those Okay, then you're going to open up this configuration CS file, copy the code, and paste it into your configuration CS file. And then for your initial create, you're going to open up this initial create, copy the code, and paste that. Okay, save everything, run a build, and then do the update database. And I'm not anticipating that you guys are going to have a problem with it. Um, I'm assuming all the commands are going to work. I've executed them multiple times. They all worked for me. I don't think you're going to have a problem. Um, if you do change automatic migrations enabled to true, and then try update database again. Okay. And once everything is updated, Yours should look, you know, similar to what I have here. So you should see migrations and you're going to see a couple files in there. Um, once you implement migrations, anytime you make changes, you are going to have to run update database. Okay, that's just kind of how migrations work. So once we do this, it's no longer going to delete the database and recreate it. It just maintains the database. Okay, and we already talked about uh, this first migration when we do the add, how we have the up and the down method. Okay. And I should mention that the update database command is the command that actually creates the database. <laughs> that's, the, that's why uh, if you're gonna have a problem, 
it's going to be on update database. Okay, if you get through that and there's no problems, you're good as gold because it worked. <laughs> um, so once you get done with all of this, then you're going to upload your Contasso University app to GitHub and throw a link into the Dropbox. And this is all you really have to work on this week. Uh, what you should work on if you have extra time is your capstone project and showcase. Uh, we don't have a whole lot left to cover in class. We have, um, we're gonna cover user roles and doing data migrations on multiple contexts. Uh, we're also gonna cover more complex data models where they're sharing data. And then we have deployment. That's all we have left to cover. Okay, so basically three main topics. Um, do you guys have any questions? What will we be doing Thursday? Um, so Thursday is going to be lab to work on projects. So, um, what I would like it, I mean, if you guys are done, uh, if you just kind of check in on Thursday and you know, just let me know you're done, then you wouldn't have to stay. Does that sound okay? All right. So I'm going to stop the video.